Mr. Paul O'Grady. Will you please put your hands together? Raise the roof. Miss Libby Savage. What, have you never seen leopard skin capri pants before? What's up with you? <laughs> OK, take it away. One, two, three. Oh, she's lovely, this one. Look at her. <laughs> Look at me, I'm the host. Come on, live life in the fast oh. lanes. Get ready for me, Good evening and welcome to Blackety Blank. Simply gotta march my Blank. Blank. <laughs> Don't bring around the <laughs> Come on, chop, chop. Delicious. <laughs> Paul O'Grady has been a part of our lives for over 40 years. You've done it all. From our love of Lily Savage to his love of dogs. I'm not some cheap tart at the Vauxhall Tavern, you know. <sighs> We're going to be celebrating him by talking to the people who loved him on screen. He could make me laugh in a way that no one else could. And off screen. He was always the same, he never changed. That was him. That was just him. That was it. He was show business. We'll relive some of our favourite Paul moments and unearth those unseen gems that show how the man from Birkenhead became a legend. Come up and see me to make me smile. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rarely met someone so genuinely funny before. <laughs> Are you 40, eh? Tell the truth. My goodness me, he loved a live audience. You had no idea what was going to come out of her mouth next. Help yourself. Look at me as a Fisher-Price play in Learn Centre. <laughs> but he was always really professional as well. So he'd get the job done and then he'd cause the mischief. You know, like a demon. And uh, that was our Paul. <laughs> Paul's extraordinary journey started in a humble council house on the rain lashed streets of Birkenhead in the 50s. Someday I'm gonna write the story of my I was born in the Tranmere workhouse during a violent thunderstorm on the 14th of June 1955. That's only partly true. I just fancied a bit of melodrama. That's an understatement. Paul was Obviously, working class lad brought up in Birkenhead. You never forget that. <laughs> you, it never leaves you. He would talk about where he grew up. He'd talk about this fabulous person, his best friend called Vera. It takes me back to my childhood when I used to share a bed with my sister Vera. And like, she was a habitual bedwetter. <laughs> my mother used to say, What end of the bed do you want, Lil? Say, I'll have the shallow end, please. <laughs> Well, I first met Paul when we were both 18. We used to go out and get drunk quite a lot. <laughs> Scraping a living together and, you know, making the, the, the most of what you had. And we were very mischievous, put it that way. I won't go as far as saying scallywags. <laughs> when I met him, Paul was working in a children's convalescent home for disabled children doing about 12-hour shifts. He'd do, like, little plays with them, and, and he was very good at art and had them all in stitches. You know, he worked hard. Because he did such long shifts in the care home, he got, like, three or four days off at a time. So then they, he'd work in the Bearsport nightclub as well to, you know, bump his money up. That's what working-class people did in them days. You know, they had no option but to get on with it. Life wasn't always easy. Paul came from a hard-working, hard-talking family, none more so than his mother. She was a good laugh, his mother. She made you laugh, but she didn't mean to. <laughs> because it's quite a matriarchal society, our family, because a lot of the men were away at sea. So you had tough women. You know, you had my Auntie Chrissy, my Auntie Annie, my mum, who was a bit of a maniac, depending on whether the moon was full or not. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, really. So it sort of, it's, <laughs> it sort of rubbed off on me. Yeah. You know, my mum had a, a sharp tongue. So did my auntie Chris. His aunt, who he always used to do the picture of her he'd, he'd paint, was of this heavily pregnant woman, cigarette roll up in, out of her, hanging out of her mouth, you know, scarf in rollers. Just like, I love that. She was quite glamorous and looked like Marlene. <laughs> and, um, yeah, just a you know, typical working class family. I was very close to his mother. I said to her, I'm gay. 
and she totally ignored me. Completely. She was rooting under the stairs for a bird cage. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> and I said, I'm coming out, but you better get back in for I knock you back in. <laughs> you know, she was like, gay me ass. You know, it was like... So, but it, I guess it wouldn't have come as a huge surprise to her because she must have. I think it would have, because don't forget our girlfriends as well. Yeah. She, she saw your child being born, didn't she? Did you, was she around when you had your baby? No, I kept that quiet as well. So you kept a lot of secrets? Kept everything her. quiet. Why yeah. did you keep so much quiet? Bloody terrified of her, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Lily Savage owed a lot to those women. If you're looking for trouble, you came to the right place. With a child to support and wings to spread, in 1974, Paul headed for the capital in search of work. He said that he got off the train in London. He looked around and he said it was, um, it was dirty and it was grubby and it was, there was Blumming people walking around, and he went, I'd find my home. <laughs> you know, he sort of, <laughs> he found himself. And it didn't take long for Paul to find his calling, caring for down on their luck families living in poverty in Camden Town. Yeah, and he was, uh, he was working for Camden Council. If a mother had to go into hospital, he used to have to go in and live in their flat with these children till they came out of hospital. It wasn't just children who looked after, looked after pensioners or whatever. He did that job for a couple of years, and then he started doing the drag shows in the evenings. He had one, one lot of kids up in Chalk Farm, and, um, and uh, he took them all to the cinema one day in Camden, Camden High Street. <laughs> and they all got kicked out because all the kids were jumping all over the chairs and screaming and shouting and everything else. Anyway, he got them all out of there, and then he got them on the bus, they got threw off the bus then as well, and then they all ran away from him, and, you know, it was like, he came out from work like a lunatic, you know. Paul's day job was as demanding as they come, and his sideline at the cabaret wasn't coming easy either. It took a while for Savage to develop into Savage. He was very nervous about picking up a mic when I first met him. I was judging a talent competition at a place called the Black Cap in Camden Town, and this long, streaky, <laughs> gangly-looking thing walked on, and a riding crop slapping his thighs, miming to a song called Lesbian Butch Dyke, and he was terrible. And I remember leaning over to one of the other judges and said, this one will never get anywhere. How wrong was I? Hello. Cecil B. Dimmitt. Hi, it's Studio Pubbing. I've just come in and out of a pack of seggies. <laughs> 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 I'm supposed to wash a dish and that. Well, he, he became very big on the gay scene. There used to be a pub over the road called the Elephant Castle. And it became so popular, and it was such a small pub, that he moved over to the Vauxhall Tavern and, uh, you know, to get more people in. And, and then I got a job behind the bar here then. <laughs> So, um, I was there for seven years. Well, this is where I met him. The Royal Vauxhall Tavern. My God, they've cleaned it up. We cram it here about 9, 9.30. The place will be heaving, literally, uh, shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow. The crowd was rough, and he tamed us like a lion tamer with five whips and a whistle. Good evening, one and all. Where's all the flaty queens? It was like being in a club in Berlin in the 1930s. It was incredible. Yeah, it was like a wild west saloon. Smoke on, you know, the ciggy on the stage and, you know, drink whiskey and all this carry on, you know. Some acts were heckled from the start. You didn't heckle, savage. Oh, you don't know my methods about how I deal with people, like ripping legs off. He gotcha. There's always fights and everything, you know. I'd see Lily jumping off the stage, you know, dressed as Lily, you know, and getting in on the act and the fight, you know, and bizarre. <laughs> well, it was great fun, though. No? We had the great times, and you know? Scuffles at the RVT weren't unusual, but in 1987, a police raid shook the community. I was doing the late show, and I'd only been in here about 10 minutes, and a copper burst in the dressing room. And I, of course, thought he was the stripper. You know, the male stripper dressed as a copper. And when I came out on the stage there behind me, the place was heaving, tables and chairs were going over, the police were extremely aggressive, and, of course, it was the height of the AIDS pandemic, so this was a perfect excuse for them all to come in. 
and they were all wearing rubber gloves. Now, can I say, what are gloves on? And what are their gloves on for? And then when he said, you know, you come to see the washing up, love, we were all, a place went up. A place went up. Paul was always using social justice in his comedy, but social causes would shape and inform his life forever. Times were, were rough in that um, there was a lot of homophobia and there was Thatcher and Section 28, and Paul was more militant than some. The reason we're here tonight, the three of us, is because of Clause 28, yes. But those situations are it's quite good for comedy and cabaret. You know, you've got something to push against, you've got something to be angry about, and it does unite everyone. Paul worked hard as ever and honed his act in front of his adoring audiences. Hi, who gave you permission to video me? Thank you very much. But he finally had to make the heartbreaking decision to give up the day job he loved. He was really into his job. He, you know, being a social worker was his calling. But he had to give up the work because he could only spread himself so thinly. And I think when you know you're a performer, which he knew deep down, Nothing's going to stop you performing. After 13 years working the underground circuit, Paul was about to be launched into the big time. Listen, I've got to show you this handbag. Now, this came from Glasgow. This did. Look at this. Weddings, funerals. How's that for a bargain, <laughs> eh? He went to the Edinburgh Festival and was nominated for the Perry Eye Awards. And that kicked him off. What we would like to do for you is a number about jealousy, passion, and bitter betrayal. He was the greatest performer. He was also a great storyteller. And the combination of the two was the reason why he could break ground that nobody else did by taking Lily Savage onto prime time television and all he did was cleaned up the act so i'd have the police rounds and i'd have our beer to be on the bar so the till would be empty come up past five i was really pleased for him you know he deserved it slogging around nightclubs for years and years can't we have a threesome tag team i don't mean a threesome like no. <laughs> wait, well, wait a minute it was an extraordinary and groundbreaking moment an openly gay man in drag was having breakfast with the nation. Anyone who's ever seen Paul first thing in the morning will know that early mornings weren't his thing. Don't oh mess around with me, no oh messing this morning. Lily had made it onto our screens. The nation loved her, and she wasn't leaving anytime soon.